thanks so much for having me here. Really uh, appreciate this opportunity from uh, Lightspeed and uh, Sanjeev and I go way back and Bob Payne. And so it's great to see you all um, and appreciate meeting all the new folks. So uh, by the way, you may not know this, but it's the year of the rabbit. And rabbits are actually quite agile, it turns out. So they have to um, avoid foxes in, in most parts of the world. And they tend to be extremely agile in their movement and their ability to, you know, evade predators and all that other stuff. So, you know, I didn't say, hey, let's put a rabbit on the cover. Uh, the, the graphical artist at the publisher you know, ended up with that. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So uh, and it coincided with this year of the rabbit. So there you go. That's why there's a rabbit there. Um, so I wrote this book because I, I truly wanted to share the joy that one experiences when you actually turn, when you are able to be agile in, in, a, in a situation. Um, you're able to overcome an obstacle. You're able to uh, deal with a problem. You're able to deal with an unexpected event in an agile way. And this is very different from agile as a framework, agile as a set of rituals or um, responsibilities. This is, I like to think of this as like really the essence of what agile means. And we're going to get into that in this talk. So let's continue here. Um, I want to start in 1982 when a fellow named Kenneth Cole decided he wanted to start a shoe company. Now, some of you may very be very familiar with Kenneth Cole products, fashion, shoes, this, that. Um, but back then, um, it was just an idea. And Kenneth actually, well, here's a funny thing. He went to my high school. Um, he's much older. He's older than me. So, um, but he went there and uh, that has nothing to do with anything, but it's just a, it's just a fact I'm throwing out there. So, you know, um, he worked for his dad for a little while in the shoe business. So he had a background in the shoe business. So when he did st start his company, he wasn't a complete beginner. The problem was 1982 was a very difficult time economically. It was a slow economy. Um, it was very hard back then to get a bank loan. Banks did not want to lend any money. You know, the economy was that slow. And Kenneth realized it would be very difficult to go that route. So he looked for an easier way to, uh, to get enough money to manufacture his shoes. He went to Italy. And he found shoemakers in Italy who were interested in making the shoes for him on credit, meaning when he when he sells the pair, he'll pay them back. They were okay with that. So that was the easy route he found in Italy. And so they made a whole bunch of women's fashion shoes. And then Kenneth had to sell them. So he flew back to New York and it was about, you know, two or three weeks before the big shoe expo event in downtown Manhattan. Sorry, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, shoe Expo is when all of the big shoe manufacturers come and show off their goods. You have small manufacturers, you have the giant ones. The small ones end up in little tiny booths where you, you know, have to distinguish yourself among hundreds and hundreds of other vendors. The big manufacturers buy the fancy showrooms, which cost a lot of money. So Kenneth Cole knew he couldn't afford the fancy showrooms, and he didn't want to just be one of hundreds and hundreds of vendors. Uh, you know, in the booths so that he wouldn't stand out from the crowd. So instead, he said, well, what if I were to like borrow my friend's trailer and park it right outside Shoe Expo? So he calls his friend who had the trailer, his 40-foot trailer. And his friend says, ha, you're welcome to my trailer. But listen, no one is going to let you park even a bicycle in Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, let alone a 40 foot trailer. So, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. He said, well, let, let me, let me talk to the city. Now he had already like created Kenneth Cole Incorporated, right? So that was the name of his company. He calls the mayor's office and he says, what, who's allowed to park like a trailer on a, a Midtown Manhattan street? And they're like, oh, well, you got to at least be a utility company working on the utility lines. Or um, you're filming a, a, a movie in, in, in the city, right? This was an I Love New York uh, period of time where they were doing a big campaign. And so if you were a production company, you were allowed to park on the street. In fact, if you were filming, you got two free New York City cops to make sure that no one messed with you as you were filming. So he said, okay, great. 
And he went and he changed the name of his company from Kenneth Cole Inc. to Kenneth Cole Productions Inc. And he went back to the city and said, we're filming a, a movie. It's called Birth of a Shoe Company. And he immediately got a permit to park a 40-foot trailer in a midtown Manhattan street. So he borrowed his friend's trailer. They spent two weeks fixing it up. And at Shoe Expo, they showed off their, uh, this is not forwarding. They showed off their trailer. They had a velvet rope. They had stairs up leading up onto the trailer. People would go in, they'd see the product. And they parked it right across the street from the Hilton Hotel where the Shoe Expo was taking place. And over two and a half days, they sold 40,000 pairs of shoes. What does this have to do with Agile? Well, I was blown away by this story because I believe that this is an incredible act of agility. Um, everything that, that Kenneth Cole did there was, was, was incredibly agile to make this, this happen, right? Uh, so it's, it's a story. It's a story of many stories that, that I want to talk about. Let's, uh, let's go further here now. So another quick story. And this is from the 1970s. Uh, Richard Branson, who was not Sir Richard Branson at the time, was in the British Virgin Islands with his girlfriend, and he needed to fly to Puerto Rico. He gets to the airport, and the flight is canceled. Everyone else who's gone that flight is just sitting around with no knowledge of like when the next flight's going to leave. This was interesting because, you know, back then there were no iPads or any other things to entertain ourselves with, right? So you really had very little except maybe a book or go for a walk or get a cup of coffee. Well, Richard Branson did something different. He went to a phone booth and he called a charter airline and he asked the charter airline, how much would it cost to fly one way from the British Virgin Islands to Puerto Rico? Oh, and how many seats are on the plane? And he did some math and he realized that it was about $39 per seat. So he made a makeshift sign and then walked around the terminal selling the one-way tickets to Puerto Rico. He sold out the flight and they flew uneventfully to Puerto Rico. Another story that I'll just say impresses me amazingly because it's not something most of us would do, right? Would you think to call a charter airline? and just sell the seats this way. I mean, it, it didn't cost him much time or effort. He did it. So I believe that agile is an adjective. I don't even believe it. If you look in the dictionary, you'll see that agile is an adjective. Nothing more than an adjective. I think it's an awesome adjective, but it's just an adjective. We just talked about an agile entrepreneur, Kenneth Cole, and we talked about an agile traveler, Richard Branson. They were agile in those particular situations. Now, I wanna also be clear. I'm not saying that these people are angels. I can point to things Kenneth Cole's done that I don't particularly like. But in the, in the birth of his shoe company, that was amazingly agile. Uh, no one's perfect, no company's perfect, no group is perfect, uh, but there are moments of agility that we can celebrate and we can learn from. So agile, again, is this adjective. It is in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary with two definitions, marked by ready ability to move with quick, easy grace, an agile dancer, or having a quick, resourceful, and adaptable character, an agile mind. Again, it's an adjective, and these are two equally good definitions, right? Both of them suffice depending upon what you want, which one you like better. Now, in the situation here, marked by ready ability to move with quick, easy grace, you could say to work with quick, easy grace as well, right? Um, quick, easy, and graceful. Those are those key words. And it's a Venn diagram. You need all three to really be agile, right? Agile's in the middle there. It's not one of, if you're just quick, you're not necessarily agile at all. If it's easy, it's not necessarily agile. It's got to have all, all three characteristics to be agile. So, Kenneth Cole. What made him agile there? Well, he avoided the difficulties of trying to secure a bank loan in a tough economic time. He went with an easier route. He found shoe manufacturers in Italy who could help produce shoes for him on credit. He was graceful in his way of navigating the crazy rules for having a trailer outside of a, a busy midtown Manhattan street. 
he was able to gracefully solve those problems and and figure out a way to put that that trailer outside the shoe expo and he quickly sold 40,000 pairs of shoes. I mean it could take other companies a year to do such a thing or more. He did it in two and a half days. Incredible. So he was amazingly agile. The other definition, having this quick, resourceful, and adaptable character. Again, it's a Venn diagram. All three really are needed if you're going to be agile. Sometimes I hear people say, well, you got to be adaptive. You got to be adaptable. Adaptable is great, but if it doesn't involve quick, usually I don't think of it as agile. Right? You can adapt very slowly. So Agile is this thing that's all three. Again, Branson here, incredibly resourceful. So in the, in the uh, situation of being stuck in an airport, he was resourceful. He found a quick and clever way to solve his problem. He adapted quickly to the situation, being stuck. He found a way to get unstuck. And he's really good at that. He was incredibly agile. So in the book, um, what happened was I wrote my favorite stories of agility. And these are from 20 plus years. Uh, and they're stories that are from my own personal experience. They're stories from colleagues' experiences. They're stories from famous people's experiences. Uh, all of them highlight aspects of agility. And at some point, I had a big mound of stories with no organization whatsoever. So I had to start organizing the stories, and that was actually brutally hard. But slowly but surely, over many months, they started to form into six sections. And I started to call them mantras. So the first is be quick, but don't hurry. Be balanced and graceful. Be poised to adapt. And I'll stop here because these three are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on in this talk today. Uh, and the rest are equally important, but there's no time to talk about all of them. Uh, start minimal and evolve. Drive out fear and be readily resourceful. Okay, and I should mention that these aren't like necessarily my own inventions. Uh, a lot of these are from famous people. If you've heard drive out, W. Edwards Deming is famous for talking about driving out fear. And as you're going to learn, be quick, but don't hurry is an incredible mantra from a great basketball coach. So what present, prevents us from being agile? There are many things that prevent us from being agile. I'm going to focus on a few very classic ones. Here's one that I see all the time. Teams organized into silos that have to somehow collaborate with each other, but don't do so very well. Silos trying to collaborate. It's a big inhibitor of agility not a what I would call a balanced team. You don't have all the right people necessary. You've got component teams or you've got uh, different departments that have to try to work with each other in an agile way. And it's very slow. There's a lot of slow handoffs. It's not really what you want. I see this as well. When you have silos, you tend to have misalignment, right? You have different teams doing different things and they're not quite aligned. And so later on, when they need to sort of integrate their work, there's there's problems. Uh, very, very common issue. So here's one story um, of many that we could be talking about, but I want to just focus in on one quick story. I'm only going to read a portion of it. This one's called Size Teams for Few to No Slow Handoffs. Phil Ensor a management consultant who invented the term functional silo syndrome in 1988, likened the grain silos he would pass on his drives through Illinois to the silos he found in organizations. A siloed team tends to focus on its own work and doesn't collaborate gracefully with other siloed teams. When an organization needs work to be done across silos, you end up with slow handoffs. One silo waiting while another silo does work. Teams that are truly agile work quickly and easily and have few to no slow handoffs. They're composed of the right mix of staff, sometimes called a balanced team, to enable high-speed value creation and delivery. Now, I'll just say two of the most agile teams I've ever worked with were not 
what Amazon would call, you know, the two pizza teams, right? These were teams that were much larger. They were, one was um, like 30 people and another one was close to 15 people and they were extraordinarily agile. Um, so, you know, if you've got slow handoffs between teams, what could you do? What could you possibly do to, to deal with that? Well, there are some solutions. One is remove one slow handoff at a time. Um, look for one slow handoff and remove it by, by inviting an external person to collaborate even temporarily with your team. Repeat for every slow handoff. That's one little technique you can use, right? Say, hey, we need to borrow so-and-so for two weeks uh, so that they can work directly with us. Is that possible? Right, and see if that's a possibility. Another one is insource the slow dependencies. Um, for any slow dependency, find a way to insource it completely rather than outsourcing it to another team. Maybe, just maybe, you could all do it yourselves. Maybe that would be acceptable, maybe not. Uh, make the slowness visible, right? If any of you have studied lean, you know, we, we talk about making the work visible. So making slowness visible is also very important, right? If you're constantly waiting between silos and slow handoffs, well, maybe you can visualize the slowness so others could see it and go, oh, we really need to fix that. And finally, you know, limiting work in process. Um, if, if, you're, if you've got a lot of things in flight, it might be causing some of the, the major slow handoffs and delays you're, you're talking about. Try to limit how many things you're trying to work on at once. So those are just some quick ideas from that, from that little story. Um, another big inhibitor of agility is, again, this, this too much stuff started and not much, not much things getting finished, right? Uh, too much work in process, work in process, whip. Y'all see this in your experience, right? It's, it's just extremely common. I was literally talking to, you know, a company that's not in the software business yesterday and, uh, they make ingredients for nutrition bars. Okay. Uh, and it's the same problem. Too many initiatives in flight, too few people to work on them, not enough flow. Another quick story. This one's called Stop Starting, Start Finishing. And I love this because it, there's a quote in here uh, from a, a famous designer. So one of one of my clients. One of my company's clients is in a constant state of hurrying as it works on 14 different initiatives with only 30 people. They have far too much whip, which makes them highly inefficient. We've advised them to stop starting new initiatives before they finish older ones, and they completely agree. But the executives at the top of their organization keep giving them more new work to start. What Coach John Wooden called activity without achievement often happens when you or your team or organization work on too many things at once. Busyness and hurrying increase while finishing decreases, sometimes sharply. Without focus, you won't be agile. Now, Apple, the Apple company just announced some new products yesterday. You may know or may not know Sir Johnny Ive. Sir Johnny Ive is a, is a, fam a legendary Apple designer. He's now a sir as well. Um, he was once asked what life lessons he learned from Steve Jobs when he worked with him. And here's what he said. Steve was the most remarkably focused person I've ever met in my life. And the thing with focus is it's not sort of like the thing you aspire to or you decide on a Monday. You know what? I'm going to be focused. It's an every minute, quote, why are we talking about this? This is what we're working on. You can achieve so much when you truly focus. And one of the things that Steve would ask, because I think he was concerned that I wasn't, was, quote, how many things have you said no to? And I would have these sacrificial things because I wanted to be very honest about it. And so I said, well, Steve, I said no to this and no to that. But Steve knew that I wasn't vaguely interested in doing those things anyway. So there was no real sacrifice. What focus means is saying no to something that you, with every bone in your body, think is a phenomenal idea, and you wake up thinking about it, but you say no because you are focusing on something else. My friend Lynn Langett keeps a folder on her computer desktop with screenshots of things she's said no to. 
She finds it cathartic. Agility requires focus. Say no more often. Stop starting. Start finishing. A very big, big uh, challenge for most organizations, my own, my own organization included, is to be able to say, uh, nope, we're not going to start something new, even if it's a great idea. Uh, we are, we're going to try to finish what we started first. And to be frank, I wouldn't have finished this book if I hadn't like severely limited my whip. If I hadn't severely said, nope, I'm going to say no to everything I'm working on the book. And frankly, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of people um, feel bad about saying no, like, like it actually bothers them. They feel like, oh, I'm not being a nice person because I said no. So it's a real issue that comes down a lot, a lot of times to our own personalities is we don't want to say no. We don't want to upset people. But you cannot really be effective if you're trying to do too many things at once. So saying no is actually incredibly important to, to achieving things and, and to you know, ultimately getting this flow of value or, be, or being agile. Okay, another inhibitor is when people don't speak up, right? Here's someone rambling on about something and it, none of these people are too interested in the topic or, or maybe they're thinking, boy, what a disaster. I, I mean, this is a terrible idea. Uh, they're not speaking up, right? If you've read any of Professor Amy Edmondson's work about psychological safety, she has a, her famous book is, um, you know, The uh, Fearless Organization. Uh, and The Fearless Organization is filled with all kinds of wonderful advice and wisdom about how to create a culture where people feel comfortable speaking up. Uh, Amy talks about silence versus voice. And when we're silent and we're not actually expressing our concerns, our ideas, our disagreements, uh, agility suffers, right? The, the creation of value suffers because we're not injecting our ideas into the mix. So I think a lot of times when people are too silent, it's also an indication of, of almost a learned helplessness. Um, so either they're protecting their own hide, right, by not speaking up, or they've just decided it's useless. It's useless to say anything, so I'm not going to say a thing. That's a pretty bad situation to be in. Um, you can become you can become helpless in a situation like that, where you just don't feel like you can you can affect any change. So I want to read a quick story about that because it's it's very common, I think, to become resentful in an organization and not think that you can make any change happen instead of being resourceful. Think about how resourceful uh, Sir Richard Branson was in that airport. Right. He wasn't just resenting the company for canceling the flight that day. He was resourceful. He found a solution. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to read a personal story from when I was very young and when I was not too resourceful. This is called Be Resourceful, Not Resentful. In the, in the early 1980s, when I was a teenager, my family lived in a tennis obsessed community in Long Island, New York. Public tennis courts were everywhere and were usually packed with players. At the time, tennis was extremely popular around the world. Millions of fans watched Beyond Borg, John McEnroe, Yvonne Lendl, Chris Everett, and Martina Navratilova engage in epic battles to win championships and become number one ranked in the world. The Port Washington Tennis Academy, where McEnroe had once trained, was only a few miles away from our house. Competition to make my high school team my high school tennis team was fierce. Only athletic kids who took tennis lessons for many years could make the team. I wanted to be one of those kids, but since my parents couldn't afford tennis lessons, I resigned myself to playing tennis recreationally and watching it on TV. Instead of being resourceful, I was mostly resentful that my family couldn't afford tennis lessons. One spring afternoon, toward the end of my senior year in high school, some friends came over to my, to my parents' house. Sitting in the backyard, the subject of tennis came up, and I mentioned to these friends that while I love tennis, we couldn't afford tennis lessons, so I never, I never competed at the high school level. One of these friends then asked me a question. She said, why didn't you pay for the lessons yourself? Her question stunned me. I had no good answer. I regularly made money by mowing lawns, 
raking leaves, shoveling snow from people's driveways and walkways, babysitting, and even writing software. Why had I not paid for the lessons myself? If I found a tennis instructor and explained that I, I wouldn't be paying, that my, that my parents wouldn't be paying for this, I would be paying myself, the instructor might have offered me a discount or given me jobs to perform at the tennis academy to lower the cost of my lessons. I could have even ridden my bike to the Port Washington Tennis Academy. Ingborg's question changed me. It was a light bulb moment. A few years later, when I finished college and was, was working in New York City, I paid for my own tennis lessons. Being resentful is a clue that it's time to become resourceful. Okay, well, that's, those are some quick stories from the book. And I want to dive a little bit deeper now into this, this first mantra here, be quick, but don't hurry. So, quick, what does it mean and what does it not mean? A lot of people are scarred by this term quick. They're like, oh, no, don't make me go quick. But quick is a good thing. They're often saying, don't hurry me and don't rush me. So the word speed is in both definitions of the word agile, right? Quick, easy grace or quick, resourceful and adaptable. It's there, both of them. Uh, but quick does not mean hurrying or rushing or moving so fast that you're out of control. It is not being out of control, right? Quick is controlled. It's smooth, it's calm, and it's controlled. Are you quick? I want to test you. Um, the people at Lightspeed said to me, you know, we don't just think that, you know, we, we want you to test this audience. And so I'm joking. They didn't ask me to do that. But um, but I do want to test you. Uh, and I'm going to test you with a tongue twister. So this is a tongue twister. It's a very famous one. And we're going to practice saying it just very quickly. Uh, I know I, I think you're muted, so I won't be able to even hear you. But I believe you'll do this. Let's do this. Let's let's actually say these words a few times. Let's say two or three or four times, but slowly. Okay, here we go. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Okay, great. So that was slow. Um, we had a hell of a lot of control there, but not much speed right? Control was the dominating uh, thing. And that's fine. Let's now do it another time. But this time I want you to be like, I, I actually want you to hurry. I want you to rush. I want you to go as fast as you bloody well can in doing this. Let's try it now for, for a couple of, of reps, okay? Peter Piper picked up a pickle peppers. Peter Piper picked up a pickle peppers. Peter Piper picked up a pickle peppers. All right. As you can see, uh, I'm hurrying. And at this point, speed is the dominating factor here. Control is not. I made I made mistakes. Um, I got tongue twisted, and uh, that's kind of to be expected here because because the balance is a little off, right? Just as it was in the slow method. Now, if we go at a, a kind of a close to hurrying, but not quite hurrying, and not slow either, right? Something that's quick. That's kind of what we're aiming for. So let, let's just try that. Try to go as quickly as you can without hurrying and making a lot of mistakes. Okay, here we go. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Okay, now we're kind of in a balanced situation here. We're balancing the control and the speed. That's this element of quickness that we're, we're searching for. Okay, we don't want to hurry and rush. Hurrying and rushing tends to lead to problems. John Wooden. John Wooden was a legendary basketball player and a legendary coach. Hall of Fame. Okay. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. He helped his UCLA Bruins, right, the college basketball team, win 10 of 12 NCAA championships, seven of which were in a row. This has never been equaled. Okay, so he's really, truly considered a legend. He's also written several books, and he's written about by other authors in many books. Uh, if you happen to watch Ted Lasso, and if you have, have not seen Ted Lasso, I highly recommend you watch it. Um, his works, uh, John Wooden's works, are in there. That's, the, that's his pyramid of success, and uh, I highly recommend you check it out. He created this mantra, be quick, but don't hurry. And he used it many times per day. 
many times per day. His his players heard him say this all the time. It was a huge focus of his style of basketball. Be quick, but don't hurry. Andy Hill played for, for the UCLA Bruins. Um, and he he talked about freshmen. Freshmen are these people that come from high schools that were incredible basketball players in high school. They could make any play, convert any shot, steal any pass, and they never thought about slowing down. So when they joined the UCLA Bruins, these players just wanted to do everything faster and faster. And the job of the coach was actually to slow them down. You know how we just slowed down after we started hurrying? Well, that's what Coach Wooden had to do with them. They were hurrying too much and rushing, and that's not the John Wooden style of playing. John Wooden devoted more teaching to this one practice than any other. Slowing down didn't mean hesitating, since hesitation impedes quickness, right? John Wooden wanted continuous flow on the basketball court. He didn't want hesitation. What slows us down? There's something I call bad slow. And bad slow is when we're just unskilled. We're hesitant. We're afraid. We're waiting on others. Maybe it's the silo situation we talked about earlier. Maybe we're just not improving, right? And those are indications of bad slowness. But there's something which is good slow, and that's where we're slowing down to be a little more calm, a little more deliberate. We are learning and improving. That's good slow. We want that kind of slow. And ultimately, this leads to something that John called quickness under control. You're slowing down in order to be quicker, which is ironic. You're slowing down to no longer be hurrying and rushing and out of control. Quickness under control is a definite advantage. So Bill Walton was another famous UCLA basketball player, and he said, you know, we practice and practice and practice, and the coach wanted us to do it faster and faster and faster. And we would practice to go so fast that when we played games, it actually felt like we were in slow motion, right? Imagine you practice so fast that when you actually play a game against another team, it feels slow because of how fast practice was. So Wooden would slow down these freshmen to learn the Wooden style of playing, and then they practice the Wooden style faster and faster and faster to be so quick. Tom DeMarco is someone you hopefully have heard of. If not, then definitely go check out his many, many incredible books, one of which is Slack. Slack is probably my favorite Tom DeMarco book. It's short, quick read, highly recommended. It has nothing to do with the tool Slack. It was written many decades before the tool came out. Um, and in that book, he says, very successful companies have never struck me as particularly busy. In fact, they as a group are rather laid back. Energy is evident in the workplace, but it's not the energy tinged with fear that comes from being slightly behind on everything, right? You know that, that fear you get? You're always behind. There's always so much, too much work to do. He doesn't see that in these excellent companies. The companies I've come to admire most show little obvious sense of hurry. Isn't that remarkable? It's not this. Where you probably are going to burn people out and they're going to look for another job, and uh, it's, a, it's a false victory, if you will, right? Be balanced and graceful. Here's my daughter. I don't know if this is coming across on Zoom or not, but she's riding her unicycle and um, showing us some balance and grace. She also likes to show friends. Okay, great. Um, so what John Wooden said, and this is the connection between mantras here, right? We have be quick, but don't hurry. And then we have be balanced and graceful as a mantra. What John Wooden observed is that if you don't have physical balance, you cannot be quick. And this is a young John Wooden showing up here when he was a basketball player. You can see he's an excellent balance. Uh -huh. So balance, physical balance, very important to quickness, but that wasn't enough. To have physical balance, it must be preceded by mental balance and emotional balance. If you don't have those, you will be hurrying. He was very concerned about the mental state and the emotional state of his players, right? If you come to a game and you've just had a terrible fight with your partner or some other events had occurred, you might not be very balanced. And then therefore you may end up rushing and hurrying on the basketball court. Wouldn't want his players to operate at that edge just before it was no longer possible to be in balance. So he's right there near hurrying. 
um, properly assess their options and respond appropriately. In other words, he wanted them to be agile. Wooden did not use the term agile, and I think it's a shame that he didn't, because I think he really, truly was talking about agility. Everything that I read about his style is, is speaks, it just, it just reeks of agility, this quick, easy grace. He was so obsessed with balance that he focused on the balance of the entire squad rebounding balance, right? How are, are our players configured to do deal with rebounding the basketball? Offense, defense, do we have the right balance of players? Do we have the right mix of sizes on our team, the right size balance? Balance, balance, balance. He was obsessed with it because he saw it as so intricately important to quickness. And here's a picture of him. The one on the left, I read an entire book by um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, which is a fantastic book called Coach and Me. Uh, and it documents their 50-year friendship. The one, the, the picture on the left is posed, by the way. Um, the photographer wanted to show like the coach instructing Kareem, you know, so they posed that. He, he talks about this in his book. Um, but, uh, you know, coach was teaching balance. In fact, when anyone on the court was practicing and they did something that was like out of balance, like a, even if they scored a, you know, a basketball went in the hoop, but they were off balance, he'd blow his whistle. He said, nope, got to be in balance. Um, and on the right is near, very near the end of John Wooden's life, where he actually needed help um, with actual balance because he was he was uh, frail and uh, had difficulty walking. Um, so balance, classic things to balance, new work and maintenance, efficiency and thoroughness, speaking and listening, um, doing and learning, right? There's a lot there that we we try to balance uh, in in our in our lives and in our work. And you can think about, what do you need to balance? What is it that might be imbalanced in your world at this point, right? Whether that's work or home, um, think about that because balance is so important to ultimately to agility. Finally, be poised to adapt. Um, poise is an interesting word because it, it speaks to balance. It means marked by balance or equilibrium. If you're poised in a state of poise, you have a, a graceful and elegant bearing right? There's that word graceful. Uh, a lot of these words just all connect up, right? Ease, grace, balance, quickness, poise to adapt. Um, Chris Rock is an incredible performer. If any of you ever saw him at the, the Oscars when he got slapped, um, I, I couldn't believe the poise with which he handled that, that crazy live situation. Um, just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And when he performs in uh, comedy clubs, you know, he, or, or let's say when he does his huge comedy specials and gets paid millions of dollars to do those, he's in big auditoriums, right? He doesn't start there though. He starts in tiny little clubs, rehearsing and trying out new material, which he writes on a legal pad. And a lot of it doesn't work, but some of it does. Some of it leads to new ideas. And so every night he'll do this. He calls it like working out at the gym. But for him, the gym is a small comedy club and he adapts and he adapts and he adapts his work till he gets to a point where he starts to get some, some gems. And then he'll take that to a slightly larger comedy club and keep working on it and keep observing how people uh, react to the material. And he adapts and adapts, quickly adapting his process, his, his, his words and his jokes to become extremely funny over time, right? That's how he does it. He is poised to adapt in the way he creates great comedy. Now, very quickly, I want to walk you through how we did something in Industrial Logic, which was uh, it sort of shows off the, how are we poised to adapt. We've built e-learning. We started building our e-learning back around 19, or about 2004, and then we got deeply into it starting around 2006, and we built this. And people struggled a little bit with navigation at that time. They were like, you know, what are those buttons at the top? What do you do? And so I, we would observe these folks in class and they clearly were struggling to know how to like move around. Now, can you all see a little four at the top right corner of the screen, near the top right corner, a little four? That's page four. It's very small. It's a little bar there and the little bar is sort of indicating where you are, right? It's, it's not something you can click on. It's just an information thing. All right, so what I did at the time was I said, let me go on to the click test. The click test was a website. It's been renamed now, but it was called the click test. You could post an image and post a question. So I posted that image and I, and I wrote, where would you click to go to page eight? Right, again, you're on page four. And I said, where would you click to go to page eight? And I got the answers. 
And you see those little yellow, little yellow dots? That's where people clicked. And I, most of them clicked in the wrong spot. In fact, 88% of them clicked in the wrong button. So clearly, Houston, we have a problem. And so I said, great, let me redesign this, but I'm not going to program anything. I'm just going to, first of all, I thought maybe my question was bad. Let me talk about a big jump from page 20 to page 40. Okay. And then, so I changed the question and this all happened within minutes, right? You post an image, you ask a question, you get back instant results from people around the world. Tried it again. And I said, let me go from page 20 to page 40. How would you do it? And this time I just mucked around with the screen. I, I went into my editor a paint shop editor, and I just changed what it looked like. I didn't program a thing, gave him this new image. Now it says the word contents. I'm hoping that most people will click on the word contents, okay? And here's what happened. They clicked on that thing on the right there. See that? That's for information purposes. 82% clicking in the wrong spot. So I thought, okay, they're not seeing the word contents. Let me try this again. Pretty much similar question, but I put it in orange. Big, bright orange, okay, view table of contents, duh. And, you know, I'm thinking this is finally it. And I do the click test and, oh my God, 77% of people uh, clicking in the wrong spot. And I started to pay attention. They, they keep clicking on that, that, that bar there. And it's not meant to be clicked on, but you know what? Maybe they know more than I do. So next question, I just put the bar up there. <laughs> And see how bad it looks because I just, I mean, I just did it in my editor, the, the paint shop editor thing, and I'm not very good at it, but I just threw it up there and it showed, hey, you're on page 31. How do you get, how do you move ahead? Now they finally clicked in the right area and 77% of people clicked there. So uh, we ended up with an even better design than this, but this is an indication of how we sort of found a way to very rapidly learn about how to change this navigation stuff within, within the space of about, I don't know, 30 to 45 minutes, all of this came out. Being poised to adapt, being able to rapidly experiment and learn, extremely important to, to uh, your agility. All right, so without further ado here, uh, I just want to finish up and maybe take some questions. Six mantras in the book, many, many, many short stories. They're all about a page, page and a half, two pages at maximum. Um, so easy to just pick up and read a story and get inspired. Um, and they're they're organized into the six mantras. So. You can learn more at the uh, website for the book, joyofagility.com. There's a free chapter you can download if you're interested. And thank you for, uh, for listening to me today. I am more than happy to take some questions. <laughs>